My first instrument was the drums, and I started that in the sixth grade, and I didn't want to play anything, but my mom read an article saying that if you play an instrument, it'll open half your brain, and I was a dumb kid, so she tried that, and it didn't work, but I really liked the drums, so I kind of stuck with it. <laughs> uh, Yes? When are we going to be uh, jamming in the morning? That's up to you, but I got to be in here kind of early. I got in, I played drums through high school and like I learned the rock and roll way. So I didn't learn to read and I didn't really learn the drums. I learned how to be good looking on the drums and like make it so it's like everyone's like, oh my God. I'm just like, Ugh! like really fast. And no one likes that in the real music world. These days you don't even need, this is terrible to say, but you don't need so much talent as a musician because, okay, the person doesn't manage to hit pitch just right. We've got a device, it'll make sure they hit pitch every time, perfectly. Uh, they're not quite so good at rhythm. They're a little rocky with rhythm. No problem, we got them right there. So you have situations, for example, these days where there's somebody who's really cute, we'll say, for a young guy, or really good looking for a young gal, not much talent, but they, they resonate with an audience really well. Okay, do the best you can singing and we'll make you sound really good, and they do it. Yeah, if you get a good musician and he messes up and it's a great take and he just messes up and he's like, I don't even want to redo it. It's not the end of the world to put just a, a hint of corrective software or auto-tune on it or anything like that. And it's even cool as an effect, like T-Pain, like he's not using auto-tune because he sounds bad as a singer. He's using it because his engineer found, oh, if I crank this weird knob and do this, that I get this cool, like distorted voice. So it's an effect at that point, but using it as its main purpose if it's done right, can actually enhance the song. Just to keep you coming home. What do you think, Jacob? Sounds pretty nice. Um... Okay. Oh yeah, corrective software is a double-edged sword because people doing these really minimalistic recording jobs and it sounds kind of blah, and they're like, yeah, but this is like raw. But at the same time, people want to hear your best, um, and you want people to hear your best. People are going to listen to that song you give them on an album every, every time they listen to your music, you know? So it's like, yes, corrective plugins and hardware and stuff like that can be used to a fault and they can be used to make it sound like it's just it's not even like there's no soul in it there's no anything in it whenever you use corrective software you're taking care of of some kind of problem if it's a one-off that something didn't quite go right or whatever that's you you can make that seem very real when you're taking somebody who just lacks the basic talent to do whatever it is they're supposed to be doing, it begins to sound pretty artificial. I got into college and I auditioned here to play drums and they were like, man, you can't read music. You're a little dork. You're like have a Blink-182 t-shirt on. And so they said, no. They said, no. <laughs> and I, uh, I went into psychology for a year and I was like, no, this isn't happening. And I re-auditioned. I got in, and then I started to uh, started to really learn as a drummer, really understand drums as a communication device, as something that is not about yourself. You are like giving it all to the to the band. You have to be playing with them, not for you. And so once I made that switch, I got a whole lot better, and I uh, I started really diving into these jazz guys, and now all I listen to is jazz. And the jazz sound is really based on texture. 
and sound. And so once I started looking into that, I was like, I looked into more recording, I looked into more sound design and how to get like the best texture of my drums and stuff like that. Instead of being a main, my main goal is drumming, I really actually fell in love with the uh, recording aspect of it all. Originally, stuff was recorded one channel and you were recording what is called a sound field. That is to say you would get the instruments and the room they're in and record that all together because that's the sound in the end that you want anyway, the sound field. And then a very clever guitarist who invented the, uh, Les Paul, you've maybe heard Les Paul and Mary Ford, he invented the solid body guitar and he said, you know, it'd be neat if I could get as many as eight channels on a machine. Had a custom made Ampex with eight channels. And that was the start of multi-channel recording. And people discovered how flexible it was and it could enable you to do a lot of things that you couldn't do with one or two channels of recording just because you could split stuff up in time. Yeah, in the professional world, and obviously there's exceptions to the rules because the professional world is now huge. Every, no one just goes to a studio. A lot of people just make their professional albums at home and they sell like hotcakes. What people are doing now, because the technology has gotten easier to run and less, a lot less expensive, is that they say, okay, we normally like to work with like three or four people. We don't need a studio any bigger than that. So we'll put up a small studio that's nice and quiet. And now we get these indie bands, like Tame Impala has this great sound. He does it in his living room. Like Mac DeMarco has a great sound. Um, and they do it from their house. So you, you can almost always find some place to record if you have to that's gonna sound pretty good. Or you can, you can tweak with it. And like people, those people know what they're doing and they're doing it from their house and people really look at that and they're gonna practice it and they're gonna be like, I could do this from my house. So that's gonna inspire a whole new group of musicians to like record from their house, know how to record things, um, understand texture, understand frequency, and not just take it to a studio and hand it off, which I think is a great thing. It might put me out of a job, but <laughs> we'll see what happens. That's one of the reasons that something like Pro Tools has become ubiquitous. Is Pro Tools the best thing to record? In my opinion, absolutely not. It was developed by salesmen. It's been pushed by salesmen. It has all of the weaknesses of something that was developed to sell rather than to impress and really work well. But uh, in a lot of studios, there is a certain element of like polish that is, you know, why a studio costs so much, why people go to a studio. Typically in the early days, you would come in, you'd be rehearsed, the music was in front of you, you'd play, you were done. Uh, as time went on and people were trying to go for unusual sounds, different sounds or different approaches just to sell more music, they would go into a studio, they wouldn't even know what they were going to do. They had a big budget, they'd sit there for a month and come up with a song and a huge bill. That's one of the reasons that they have gone to doing it with not everybody in the studio at the same time, just two or three or one or two or even one and then somebody in another studio will do some stuff or in another studio do some stuff and so on. So you can have a record that or CD or whatever you want that's partly been recorded in Australia and partly in South Africa and partly in England and it sounds terrific or awful. As far as like the jamming goes, it doesn't happen so much in the mainstream anymore like it used to, but it's still here. It's still kicking. It's still like, and there's this whole like hipster bring it back type thing, which is like, I think, I think when you get away from like the, uh, the dorky mentality of it is a really beautiful thing. So it's, yeah. Because multi-channel recording is done at different times and often in different locations, you never get the cohesiveness that you can get when you have a bunch of really good musicians in a really good sounding room having a great day. That's a unique experience. That, that's gonna stay here for a while. That's really how music is meant to be expressed as a, people are getting together and they have a conversation with things other than their mouths. They, they're playing at each other, with each other, bouncing off ideas. Some of it's crap and the editor just <laughs> edits that out and then you get a nice song from it. So 
I like that. I like that idea. It's way. Uh, it's from the heart. It's it's felt way stronger where it counts in the left nipple. <laughs> no.